Our gospel this morning is from the fifth chapter of Matthew. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely, especially on my account. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. It's the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Oh, it's the Beatitudes. This is always a fun time uh, of the year. When we preach Beatitudes, because you read them and you go, oh, that doesn't make any sense at all to me, and then you just kind of walk away. And, and we do it every year. And so every year we are, we're always trying to, to take it apart. We're trying to put it together in, in a fashion where it starts making some sense, especially in our culture. I mean, they're nice, but they're not very useful. And when you're asked why, you, it's commonly, the answer that we, are, that we get is commonly focused on this understanding that we haven't got a clue what Jesus is even talking about here. So then what happens? Well, then, well, see, then we walk away from it. It's Scripture that's detached from us. And all you have to do is just ask yourself a very simple question, and that is, what is a blessing? What's a blessing? I mean, think, think for a moment. Now, if a friend or someone were to come up to you at the store or the coffee shop or something and say, you know, what is a blessing? What does it mean to be blessed? How would you even answer that? Well, you might think that the, then if you, if you can't work your way through that one, maybe we should go back to a definition, right? So there's no better place to go in New Testament material is to the original writing of, of, that, of those books, which is Greek. So we'll do that. We'll go directly into the Greek definition for blessed. And here you go. Happy, fortunate, well off. Did you find much help there? I mean, could the poor in spirit really feel fortunate in inheriting the kingdom of heaven? I mean, really? I mean, is, is that really what Jesus could have meant when he made that statement and all these others? I mean, the word blessed is a real tough word to define because in the way that Jesus uses it, the meaning just kind of eludes us somehow. But maybe, maybe the question is not what it means, but maybe it's more about what it feels like to be blessed. Now, that kind of changes things because now we can ask a different question. Instead of what does it mean to be blessed, now what does it feel like when you're blessed? Well, now this is a message that Jesus delivers. We've got to keep this in context, you know. He's delivering this to a people who lived in a very different culture than ours. Their culture was about honor and shame. I mean, if you did what was expected of you, it, it was honored. It was wonderful. If you failed to do what was expected of you, well, there was shame. But this talk about being blessed really didn't fit into that so well either. I mean, Jesus defied both of these cultural norms, which brings us to today. 
us. Well, it appears that we live in a culture that is probably best described as one of affirmation and blame. Starting, starting from a very early age, very early age, it seems that just showing up at an event or an activity, and then later in life, going to a meeting or a seminar, it results in your getting a ribbon or a piece of paper or some kind of a medal that affirms your participation. The affirmation is nice, but it's kind of empty. And then there's the blame part. This has become all but a national pastime. And I mean, it's the politician's fault, right? Or it's the other party's fault. Or how about, we're going to hear this one a lot today, it's the referee's fault, right? It's the referee's fault. It's the official's fault. It's my teacher's fault. It's my parents' fault. My child's fault. The dog ate it. The list is endless. All we have to do is just kind of, you know, take a step back and just point. But taking a close look at blame really shows that blame is just a way of kind of discharging a, the pain and mix-up and discomfort and the disappointment that builds up within you. And you don't take any responsibility of any of it yourself. It's all out there. So how do you see blessedness in that kind of a culture? That's not so easy either. You know, and that brings us right back to square one. Here we are, okay? We can define it. We can define it. It means happiness, being well off, being favored. But to ask, how does it feel? What's it feel like? Now you probably draw more of a blank because we don't see the happiness in mourning or in being meek or being persecuted not in today's culture. But don't you think that perhaps one of our big problems today is understanding blessedness? Understanding it. It's centered on the fact that we have been, we've been taught to pursue happiness, and then if that doesn't work out, we'll settle for the affirmation and if those two things don't work out, oh, then we'll relapse into blame and start pointing. And, in, and that is a circle that absolutely generates nothing but negative emptiness. I mean, let's go pursue happiness. That's great. But if you don't get there, you need some affirmation, right? Yeah, that'd be nice. But you know, if that isn't fulfilling for you, blame. The reason I don't feel good is because of this or that or someone or something. What we really need to do is start making sense out of Jesus' comments. And to do this, we need to replace this way of thinking about an empty affirmation and a corrosive blame with just blessing. Something you can actually feel. And that means... Well, number one, strengthening our relationship with God by actually applying God's promises to our daily lives. You know, the promises like accepting God's unconditional regard for us, keyword, unconditional, God's assurance to accompany us, always with us, and promise that we deserve love, honor, and respect. I mean, this all sounds a little bit like it's kind of off topic, but we'll keep going with this. And now let's look at the Old Testament, Micah, because what Micah was going through is almost a snapshot of today. In our Old Testament reading, Israel has turned away from God. And they're not feeling so all very good blessed about anything anymore. In fact, there's this ugly division that's going on that's between the, the wealthy and the poor, and there just doesn't seem to be any justice. Now, have you heard that this last couple of weeks? Application of the law, who's above the law, who's below the law, law treats these people one way, treats people the other way. No justice? 
Well, there's a division. So God reminds all of the Israel's, uh, Israelites at the time then that he's done everything for them. I've done everything for you. And then he even asks them the simple question. He goes, what do you want from me? What do you want? What, what have I done? Tell me. Well, now, you can imagine that kind of freaked out the Israelites. In fact, that spooked them to the point where they went a little overboard now. And they're thinking, well, they think the problem is that they're just not worshiping right. There's something wrong with the way we're worshiping. And some even think now that they need to sacrifice their firstborn son, you know, or maybe we need five candles on the altar instead of two or three. Or maybe we should be bringing live chickens to the altar. But God says, no, you're missing it. You've missed the point. You are blessed, but you've lost what it feels like. It's the feeling that they've lost. To be blessed feels like you have someone's unconditional regard. There's that word again, unconditional. That means you've got nothing to do with it. It feels like, like you're, you're, you're not and never will be alone. And there are a lot of times during the day when every single one of us wonder why we're alone. But you really, you're accompanied everywhere you go. And being blessed feels like you've got worth. You're worth something. This society has got people labeled to the point where you're worth nothing till you're worth everything. And it's not because of something you did. It's not because of something you might do. It's just simply because of who you are and that you deserve it. It's about your relationship with God. It doesn't depend on wealth or health or status. It's not a reward for any righteous duty that you've done, and it has absolutely nothing to do with these empty affirmations and blame. Blessedness is God's sheer gift for you. You accept it, and you will feel different. Jesus says the poor in spirit are blessed. Hmm. Well, that's because poverty of spirit bears within it the blessing of abundant life. When one is poor in heart and poor in mind, one is emptied, free of clutter, available, roomy. There's room for God. There's room for hope. There's room for love. But when we are wealthy in spirit, more than likely we're pretty full of ourselves, eager to display how much we know how much we can do. But there's no room in God for that, to do a new thing. So Jesus says, blessed then are the poor in spirit, for they're not so full of themselves. Can you even imagine how that feels in this world today? I can assure you there are still some places in this world where people feel blessed in their poverty. And now I'm going to go reaching right back to Tanzania again. And I've told you, I think I learned more about, about ministry in Tanzania than I've ever learned. But when you go into a village of people who have absolutely nothing, and I mean nothing, and then they see you coming and they act like the very presence of God is taking place. You're there because God has sent you to them. It's God's grace. It's a gift. It's a blessing that they don't deserve. Now, when was the last time you felt blessed when you had a guest or a visitor? So what will it take for you and I to appreciate God's blessings? Well... We're not going to turn this culture around anytime soon, but that has never been an excuse to do absolutely nothing in God's eyes because I mean, it's easy to start somewhere, like at home or right here at First Lutheran. Easy. You know, the message in Micah is pretty clear. Micah says that the most important thing that we can do is really centered around our relationship with God. We need to get back to the basics. You know, get the clutter cleared away. Take a deep breath. Listen once again to God's expectations. 
because God has told us what is good and how to feel blessed. We're to do justice. That means do what's right for your neighbor, especially those with needs. Love kindness. Seek to help others not so that you look good or because you've got this list of things on your refrigerator door that you've got to check off, but do it because that's what's in your heart. And then walk humbly with God because we're not alone. We were never meant to be alone, and we are promised that with God at our side, we will want nothing. Remember, Jesus is telling you and me and everyone in these simple phrases, these promises of happiness, that we are blessed. We're blessed in every way imaginable from one, for one simple reason. It's because we are simply worthy of it. We're worthy of blessing. And we're worthy of a relationship with God that feels like nothing else. After all, it was Almighty God who created us and who called us so. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, so often in Scripture, you go one direction and we go the other. And it's not because we don't want to, it's because we don't understand. Oftentimes we're misled. For in this world, this is the life that we live every sick second of every day. And so often your words get pushed aside. Help us to remember what it means to be loved by you, what it means to be your children, and what your promises mean to us. Lord, that is all we need to carry us through. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen.